Sorry, Ian. <laughs> no worries. Ah, uh, here, here we are, everybody. My apologies. Uh, I actually went live just randomly on my channel instead of actually putting it to uh, the one with Ian. So, uh, sorry about uh, that, everybody. But it's a pleasure to see you all. And uh, <laughs> once again, I'll start the intro. I have with me Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis, uh, one of the biggest uh, channels on here. Uh, uh, you know, on the internet. Let me put myself on for a sec. Hey, everybody. Um, and yeah, we're here to talk about return strategy and tactics. Uh, wow, we have a lot of you on already. Hey, Michelle from Virginia, pretty close to me. Hey, Richard from Boston. Hey, Livin. Um, Michelle, Jude, Janet, everybody. Pleasure to see you. Um, so yeah, as I said, you know, we're going to talk about return strategy and tactics. And um, first off, Ian, how is your day going? I'm doing great. So just busy with the with the whole content game, Mirban. You know how it goes. Like the the YouTube world never sleeps. So there's just <laughs> always every day I, I come in here. There's some some new video I've got to prepare for, and so this is just like a normal day for me. Just setting up the <laughs> the camera and, and talking talking tennis in some form or fashion. So thanks for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to it a lot. Yeah, same here. You know, obviously, um, I think most of you, if not all of you, know about Ian's channel, and he's putting out a lot of great content, and, you know, very different content, too, in terms of, you know, players facing off against each other, live commentary, um, so really great stuff, especially during these times to, to check out, so obviously, you want to check out Ian's YouTube uh, channel. So, quick... Um, Quick mention for our sponsor of the pod. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I have a podcast too. Uh, a sponsor of the <laughs> summit, uh, Slinger Bag. So Slinger Bag, you can see it behind me. Let's see if I get the right. Okay, that's good. Decent. So Slinger Bag, I have the Slinger Bag, and it's a great product. Uh, I use it a lot, especially during these times. It's been really helpful for me, and definitely highly recommend that you check it out. I've gotten some emails from people about it already and that they purchased it. So just a big shout out again to Slinger Bag. So, um, Ian, uh, I understand that you have some really cool, uh, you know, clips for us to check out and to analyze. So, uh, really excited to get into it. So, I, I mean, I'll just let you take it away and then just relay some questions to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that you, you gave me the, the return of serve to focus on Mirban. I think it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of tennis, <laughs> like coaching and improvement and for sure, amateur players. And I get it. Like, it's hard. It's difficult to work on your return of serve if you don't have like a dedicated practice partner, training partner, or a coach that you see a couple times a week or at least once per week. Or like a $10,000, $15,000 ball machine with like the hydraulic, you know, lift and all that sort of thing. So I understand it from a practical standpoint, but I still don't think there's enough emphasis on the return. You, I'm sure you've probably said yourself many times, Mirban, that the the serve is the most important shot in tennis. And mm -hmm. if the, or maybe you don't, uh, do do you believe that? Do you do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, you I know it's interesting. You. I was I was like hardcore on on that for sure. Uh, but you know, recently I've I've realized like you know the, the the huge importance of the return too. So, but yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, th that's just kind of like a cliche like phrase, right? That like all of us coaches say like the, the serve is the most important shot in tennis. And if that's true, and, and I believe it's true, if the first shot in any point is the most important because it sets the tone for the point, it's like the, the minimum buy-in to play tennis. I have to hit this ball into that box over there or else we can't play tennis. Like if I buy that theory that the serve is the most important, then the return has to be the second most important shot in tennis because all of those same uh, that same weight is on the returner just like it is on the server. If I can't just put the ball back in play, then we don't play tennis. And I think there's a, a big misunderstanding still. So many people are doing an amazing job. Uh, Warren Pretorius is doing an amazing job of talking about the statistical reality of tennis and how short the average point is in tennis from beginners to advanced amateur players to professional tennis players. Your average tennis point is just a couple shots. It's like around three shots. So if you don't practice your return and if you have poor habits in your return of serve baked in, then you're making the whole game unbelievably difficult, but most players don't focus on it. 
So if it's okay with you, uh, Mirabhan, we'll definitely talk about strategy and tactics, but I'd love to start with some technical reminders and kind of best practices and a couple drills that people can do to really make sure that they have some good technical or physical habits with the return to surf. Yeah, I would love to do that as well, Ian. So uh, let's definitely take a look. And, you know, last year, Greg Lasseur did a return, a, you know, a presentation on the technical side, too. And that was really popular. So I'd love to see and I'm sure the audience would love to see your tips on the technical side before we get into any strategy and tactics. Nice. Yeah, sounds good. I think it's so critical. And so uh, thing number one, I I'm going to show a couple of different ways of approaching this. Uh, this first example we're going to look at here is, is Djokovic. Pretty widely regarded as, at minimum, like one of the best returners of all time. Some people definitely refer to him as the, the best returner of all time. So definitely we can take some notes from him. And then I'm going to show uh, the Bryan brothers as well. They have a little bit different style. I want to show two different styles of preparation. But either way, the split step is the thing that starts it all off. Uh, Novak likes to take a step forward first. This is the way I like to do it. Andy Murray, another one of the best returners of all time, uh, also likes to do it that way. Personally, I like feeling like I have some uh, momentum leading me into the court before I make my split step. But I'll show you the Bryan brothers in a second as well. But that step just kind of initiates or jump starts his movement, and then he goes into uh, a split step from there. A split step is another one of those things I feel like that is just unbelievably a underutilized. It's underused by amateur players. And I think most tennis players out there who are watching me right now assume that they split step, but they actually don't. And for me on the return of serve, if you're going to split step on one shot in your tennis matches, just please do it on the return of serve. You have however many seconds, you know, 20, 25 seconds to prepare for the next point every time your uh, opponent is getting ready to serve. Sometimes it's a little less depending on the, you know, the tempo of the, the match. But if you're not at least split stepping when your opponent serves, when you have nothing else to think about except just getting ready for your opponent to hit you a serve, then there's no way you're going to do it in the rest of the point. So my recommendation to players out there is to focus just, if you're just going to focus on one thing in your next match, just focus on split stepping on your return of serve specifically. And I almost guarantee you'll play better at tennis in your next match than you probably usually do. Even if you already usually split step on your return, just the, the act of focusing on timing that perfectly and just making sure that, that you're activating your body, you're getting it ready for the second most important shot in the whole game of tennis, just putting a premium on preparation and like mental acuity as your opponent is getting ready to hit their serve will bring huge, huge... Uh, rewards. So this is like style number one is taking a step forwards and then going into a split step. And we'll talk about what next to what to do next after after this. But let me show you another kind of style. Um, here's the the Brian brothers. And this is uh, Bob back here on the, the ad side. Uh, they both do this pattern instead where they, they both like to kind of double hop and then jump into a split step which is a little bit different, but your two main kind of styles or flavors are either starting in a, in a wide base and then going right to a split step as the ball hits the server's racket, or take, and this takes a little bit more kind of timing and a little bit more precision, taking a full step forwards to gain a little bit of forward energy and momentum, which is what I prefer to do. And then after taking that single step, timing your, your split step again with contact from the the server. So these are kind of the, the two styles or different flavors of preparation for the return of serve. Does that make sense, Mirban? Yeah, perfect sense, Ian. Appreciate that. Um, in terms of the split step technique, uh, you know, is there, from the height perspective, like, is there any guidance on that as to like how high you want to jump? Sometimes I see like really exaggerated, you know, high jumps on the split step. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think one of the one of the main objections that tennis players have as far as well, I don't really want to use the split step because one of the the main reasons that I hear why people don't do it is because they feel like it takes too much energy. Definitely don't feel like this is some like athletic test of like how big and aggressive of a split step. Like just because you jump higher and go wider 
doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be any better off. In fact, you absolutely, it is absolutely possible to exaggerate it, Mirban, and just do it to a point where it's, it's no longer constructive and you're just killing a lot of energy. And the higher and bigger you make it, the more difficult it is to be precise in timing it. The precision of when it's done is way more important than how like big or athletic you make that step. In fact, I would, I mean, I would argue that this is a relatively um, low key, you know, split step here from, from Bob Ryan. Uh, it's just, he's just basically hopping forward six or eight inches. And I think that the width is important. Like the size of the jump isn't super key, but if you can get yourself to a, a double shoulder width uh, wide base and just time some, you don't even have to leave the court. If you just time some kind of like bounce or like some kind of sinking in of your, your legs right as the, the serve is hit, I think that's the most important thing. Great stuff, Ian. And then um, in terms of like choosing which one, um, any any thoughts on that based on the type of game style or shot you're trying to accomplish, et cetera? No, that's an interesting question. I haven't noticed any kind of pattern or correlation, to be honest, in terms of like game style and which st which style of uh, return gets used, uh, which st style of split step gets used on the return of serve. So I, I wouldn't overthink it. Uh, I would say try both of them out. And I would highly recommend everybody watching this to, on your very next tennis match, record yourself using your phone. Probably 50% of you right now who are watching, who are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, like I'm doing that, probably are not split-stepping. And I, I, would, I would highly encourage you to record yourself and really see what you're doing now in terms of your, your footwork on your return of serve specifically. And then if you are shocked to discover that you don't split-step, then just try each of these in your next match or your next practice session. See which one feels more natural and comfortable. It might feel like, to be honest, the the Djokovic style, it, there's just a lot more moving parts. Having to time the a full stride and then the split step is just much more tricky or tedious than starting in a wide base and just making like literally just kind of the hop like the Bryan brothers. So honestly, like if you've never split step before, I would say use the Bryan brothers method. Uh, if you're maybe looking to take your preparation to the next level, then maybe try taking a step forwards, but I'm not at all like insinuating that this is like a better way of doing it. I would say whichever one is more comfortable, go with that. Beautiful. Thanks. And um, yeah, feel free to, to proceed uh, with the next uh, phase. Cool. Yeah, just one more kind of big thing um, in terms of footwork. And then I'd like to do a little case study on swing technique as well. And then we'll go into strategy. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds like a plan. Cool. So after the split step, the next most important footwork part, footwork part is what happens with the alignment of the feet and the first move to prepare for the income. And we're gonna look at two examples here. One is a forehand, one is a backhand. This is a, a backhand example from Novak. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in here. He just finished his split step. And I want you to watch what happens to his feet here, but in particular, that left foot. So he's reading that the ball is coming to his left. And I want you to watch his move here. This left foot actually doesn't even touch on the court. And this is kind of, next level footwork kind of magic here, wizardry, where he's lifting up right here is, is his split step. And now if you keep your eyes glued on that left foot, it hovers over the court and never touches. And so Djokovic is gathering his body's energy and momentum. And then on his way down, as he reads what direction the ball is going, the foot on the side that the ball is coming to is pointing out and pivoting and then the other foot is kind of planting and giving him something to push off of and if you can time that and flow in that direction that the ball is moving in without actually like landing in your split step and getting like flat footed right on top of the court which totally not totally but to a large degree defeats the purpose then you can start to really spring in the direction that the ball is headed so uh, Novak here again, without his left foot even touching the court, is making like a five foot, you know, six foot, like full stride out in the direction of the ball. This is a move that for most tennis players watching at home would take multiple steps. And most 
tennis players at local, you know, tennis courts and clubs aren't making the split step either. So they're starting from a static position, just standing there. They're waiting for the ball to get hit. They see where the ball is getting hit. And then they're like, oh, there it goes. I better start like moving my feet. And then they start chasing the ball. So it's a purely reactive thing. Because Novak has taken a full stride to energize and activate his body, lift it off the court, and then timed that precisely so that on his way down, he's reading where the ball is going. He can take all of that uh, energy that lifted up and then on its way down, send it in the direction of the ball. So this is, this is why players like Novak and you know, every other elite world-class player have such, inc- it seems like magical like reaction time, but in reality, they actually started moving for the ball before the ball even got hit. Like imagine, imagine going into a foot race and literally start having the ability to start running a second before your opponent. Obviously, that's a huge advantage. That's what Novak is doing here to prepare himself for the return of serve. Meanwhile, most people watching the stream are just waiting for the, you know, for the gun to fire and then they start running. And so it's like literally starting the race from behind. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense, Ian. Really appreciate pointing out that that out. So, in terms of um, you know practicing at home or on the court or wherever we can right now, I mean, what is there any sort of like drill or anything that you suggest for us to uh, to really just you know hone into this proper technique of the split step? Yeah, for sure. I would I would definitely do shadow you know practice swings on the the split step and the preparation um you can practice either the the wide starting point and and the split or you can practice taking the uh, the step forward the stride forwards and going into the split and then i would drill individually forehand and backhand going from the split step and then practice planting so for right-handed going to a backhand the right foot is going to touch and the left foot is going to pivot out and practice going up into a split step touching with the right toes and then turning and going into a unit turn with the left foot pointing to the left do that like 20 30 times and then practice lifting up into a split step touching the left toes down first and then for a right-handed player making a forehand unit turn and pivoting the right foot out to the right um and then uh, after you've kind of gotten comfortable with the 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 sequence of steps and the flow of kind of movement and energy then turn on uh, on TV uh, a tennis match or on your computer. Go to YouTube and type in you know whatever tennis match you want to watch, and pretend to be the returner when the server is on the other side of the court. And so mm-hmm. practice timing your split step with the actual player actually hitting serves on the you know on the other side of the court on the far side, and practice making a move to your right for a forehand or to your left for a, for a backhand for right-handed players. And if you do that for like five minutes a day, just do the, the shadow swings and then do like two or three minutes of like the point play training, watching on a, on a screen and practicing making your, your split step, timing it perfectly and then flowing in the direction the ball is headed. I, it's so underutilized uh, and uh, I think underappreciated how much that kind of training can really dramatically help on the return game in real life. Yeah, 100% Ian, appreciate that. And yeah, so we have some comments specifically about the split step. Max says, I like taking a step forward on my return as well. Jamie says, I also take a step forward on my return, but I actually slide the back foot into the split step. Maybe that comes from playing on clay. It's an interesting one. Um, And we do have some strategy-based ones. However, I'm thinking to perhaps hold off until we get to that those uh, videos. So maybe we'll we'll hold off, Ian. What do you think? Yeah, let's wait on the strategy. I just have one more kind of main point I'd like to make in terms of swing technique, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Go for it. So um, this is. uh, By the way, I can totally picture, and I've I've hit a decent amount on clay too. I totally can picture that the toe drag uh, on the the stride forwards going into the split step. I don't think there's anything wrong with that uh, right. at all. It's just kind of, inter- I've never really thought about it before, but I can like feel the, the grit like beneath my, <laughs> my right uh, toes um, for whatever reason that just really triggered like a, like a special moment for me there. Nice. Um, so let's talk about, uh, I'm, I'm missed congressional, the, the clay courts there. 
Let's yeah. talk about swing technique. I think swing technique is dramatically overcomplicated and overstressed about when it comes to return of serve. The reality is we're, we're just talking about forehand and backhand ground strokes. And it's a small percentage of tennis players. I, I don't, I don't say this to, you know, I don't mean for this to be like condescending at all, like at all. The vast majority of tennis players don't have to deal with 120 mile an hour, you know, my, myself included. Like the, the fastest serve that I've seen in the last six months is maybe 100 or 105. Most of the serves I'm receiving are like an average and maybe an average speed of like 50 or 60 miles an hour. So most of us are not getting absolutely destroyed and blown off the court by Evo Karlovic. Like we, we don't have to worry <laughs> about that kind of uh, delivery. So I don't think – I think players tend to overcomplicate things and overstress about – like keeping it short and not taking the racket back so far and, uh, you know, keep everything super compact. Like at the, it's just a ground stroke. It's just a forehand or a backhand. And so uh, I, don't, I don't say that to, you know, minimize any other tip that might be helpful to people. But I think if, if you can just relax, focus on the footwork, and then just make a full confident swing, then a lot of problems are going to be kind of automatically resolved. The errors that I tend to see fall into one of two categories. Either it's a swing like this where somebody is like so afraid of missing the return that the swing ends up being very kind of guided. This is a, this is a, a player who's almost just kind of right knocking on the door of four or five, strong 4-0 level player, and she, she has a big – powerful swing she uses this is a student i just had a week or two ago and her return of serve specifically she came in that was like the top of her list she was like i like i need to fix my return it's terrible and in a rally situation where it's like hey here let's rally some forehands everything is long and smooth and relaxed and able to make a lot of hit a lot of top spin and and curve on the ball direct the ball where, where she wants it to go and then all of a sudden on return of serve this is me on the other side um, and I'm not sending her here. I'll play it in full speed. I'm not, I'm not sending her anything <laughs> aggressive. I, I'm sure everybody watching will agree with me here. Uh, I don't have a speed di you know, dialed up here, but it's probably around 50, maybe mid forties. Um, I'm not sure if it's a first or second serve. It doesn't really matter. It's I, I'm just trying to spin it in the box basically. And so I think players get so in their head about the fact that it's a return and oh man, what do I where do I want to aim it and uh, you know what pattern am I trying to play and um, am I being like Agassi and like just keeping my hands in front of me and like they have all these like different thoughts and it ends up being this like like super tight tentative like oh I'm just gonna like steer it and play and it's almost impossible to hit a consistent and effective tennis shot with that kind of tentative like careful kind of approach. And then on the way other end of the spectrum, the other big technical mistake I see players make is they get so amped up and hyped up because they know they're receiving a weak serve that they just go into like Hulk smash mode and just like totally destroy the ball. And they hit some incredible winners, but over the long term, they end up beating themselves because they're going for such a huge, big shot. This student I had was on the other end of the spectrum, but those are the two big like technical mistakes that I see. Yeah. Love that, Ian. Um, thank you for that. I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions that jive with what's going on here. Uh, so Gordon asked, do you recommend the Djokovic double hop split step? Um, I'm not, uh, I, I mean, I know what he's talking about and we saw that from actually Bob Bryan it, here was kind right, of like the, the double hop. And you'll yeah. see this from the Bryan brothers quite a lot, actually, I, more than any other player that I've noticed. Um, I can picture Novak. I don't have a video of Novak doing it right now. I don't think I can. I can picture Novak doing that. The double hop. I think in all of these examples, it's just a straight up, you know, standard. You, you can see a little bit of it here. So here's the thing. Uh, was it Bob? Was it Bob that asked the question? Uh, Gordon. Gordon. Uh, sorry, Gordon. So Gordon, here, I'll, this is a slow motion video. Shout out to Love Tennis YouTube channel, by the way. They have a lot of fantastic slow motion footage like this. So I'm just gonna play this and you'll see Novak's heels kind of coming up a bit. And then he goes into like a real split step. Interesting, he didn't take a step there. 
And so you'll see professional players do this where the, it's, it's like they get into a wide, like ready stance and they'll kind of have like a couple of preliminary kind of firings of their, their legs where they're, they're kind of like pre preparing themselves and kind of activating their muscles to get ready. I don't consider that a style of split step. I simply consider that as like a personal, uh, not, not quirk, but like, uh, uh, of idiosyncrasy that they just like to get their muscles like prepared and fired. The most important thing is that there's a singular precise split step that happens no matter what you do beforehand that feels good to you, you know, physically to, to prepare yourself. The most important thing is that there's a very distinguished clear moment where now like I'm split stepping and I'm getting ready to make that pivot and that turn in whatever direction the, the ball is coming. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Makes sense, Ian. So there's another one. Um, oh, yeah. So Charlie is actually asking about her footwork. So he asks, what do you think of her uh, footwork? It looks like she's taking a step back as she's setting up. Yeah, footwork was something we worked on uh, together as well. This was at the beginning of our, our this is like initial evaluation footage that we shot before we started uh, working together. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with moving around. Like this is a ball that I think she probably felt like she could have taken as a forehand or a backhand. And she's choosing here to pivot and move around to her left to take this as a, as a forehand. And you'll see professional players doing that as well. I don't have a, a problem with that at all. And in fact, if you look at her uh, right foot, if we uh, draw a little circle here on her uh, right heel, and then we look at where her right heel ends up as she prepares, it's actually in front of where she started and I think maybe she misread this and it bounced up higher than she thought. And then she ended up kind of backtracking a bit, but she's not actually moving backwards. It kind of has the, an illusion of her moving back, but worst case scenario, she's staying level with the baseline. Would it be nice for her to transition into the shot? Yeah, absolutely. But you can tell based on her swing that she's got a lot of other like stuff going on in her head right now. And she's just kind of in survival mode and trying to like steer it over. And it takes, it takes time, I think, for players to gain confidence in the return. And for me, it always starts with the, with the feet first. And then just like a very basic understanding of just stay calm and just hit a forehand. Stay calm and just hit a backhand. And through repetition, players can start to groove some, like, some consistency and string some together and really gain some confidence in the shot. But if the only time you practice returns is like during matches, and you're hitting a return every, you know, whatever, 60 seconds or 90 seconds, and then you hit a bunch of other shots, and then you hit one return, and then a bunch of other shots, and then you hit one return, and then a bunch of other shots. That's not good enough training to really foster a really solid, confident feeling for the shot. And that's where I think players just have to take responsibility for their training, find a practice partner. I know it can be a struggle sometimes find somebody who's willing to hit serve repetitions to you and and groove the shot uh, or what you can do as well uh, alternatively is another good uh, practice idea mirabon is to is to practice the the step and the split have a ball in your your non-dominant hand make a unit turn and just drop a ball and practice making a, a confident swing you can do it on the backhand uh, side as well same thing and that way you can get repetitive, you know, training and just like reinforce in your mind the footwork, the, the movement, the swing, and do it again and again and again for 15, 20 minutes. It's not as good as somebody delivering you a ball, but at least you're giving your brain and your body something to kind of grab onto and build some confidence around. Yeah, I love that, Ian. Uh, appreciate, uh, you know, all the great technical tips. So, I mean... You know, we have a lot of questions about strategy, which obviously makes sense. Um, was there anything yeah. else that you wanted to touch upon in terms of the strategy side, or sorry, in terms of the technical side before we go on to strategy? No, no, I think that's good. Uh, yeah, let, let's let's make a move to strategy. Okay, awesome. Go for it. <laughs> Is there like a recurring uh, question? You said there's been a bunch of questions in terms of uh, audience questions. Uh, yeah, I, I know I'm jumping around, so apologies, but yeah, there was one that uh, asked, um, do you plan where to hit your return before you step to the line? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. You should always have a plan for a serve. You should always have a plan for a return of serve as well. 
And I think the, the key thing here is keeping in mind something that I just very briefly touched on uh, earlier was that uh, that idea of uh, most points just not lasting very long. If you can make your first shot and one additional ball, so either your serve or your return, and then one more shot, and if you can do that point after point after point, you've got a really good chance of winning whatever match you're playing. So keeping in mind that most points end with a mistake and not a winner, and shout out to Warren uh, Pretorius and Craig O'Shaughnessy too, but both of them do fantastic yeah. work around errors and winners and uh, so yeah. on and so forth. Keeping in mind the fact that level upon level upon level, all, all the way up to the pros, most points end with a mistake. The question you need to ask yourself is where can I aim that gives me the best chance of just getting in this point, period. I'm not talking about hitting a winner, not even talking about stressing your opponent, just, just to start the point in a neutral scenario where neither of you have a big advantage or disadvantage. So for uh, doubles, that's obviously going to be uh, priority number one is going to be to avoid the, the server's partner. And priority number two is going to be some kind of uh, depth would be fantastic. That way we don't give the server the option of coming forwards. We just kind of tell them you need to stay back there and, and keep playing ground strokes. Or alternatively, if they're a serve and volley type player, that we might need to adjust the height or the depth a little bit. But when I go into a, a doubles match, personally, those, these are the only two things I'm thinking. Avoid the net player and hit it deep. And then from there, it's all, it's all making adjustments. In other words, if the net player is super aggressive and just cutting tons of stuff off, maybe I'll consider down the line. But I'm not even thinking about down the line until they make me try that lower percentage shot. And likewise with the, with the server, I'm waiting until they show me something special to adjust my target. I'm not going to aim six inches over the net if they're not crashing in behind their serve point after point after point. So I'm, it's like the most boring you know, answer ever. But the reality is most points don't last long and most points end with an error. So if you're the one that's taking it upon yourself to either you know, uh, thread the needle down the line or thread the needle just over the net and hit some kind of uh, crazy angle and try to like stretch the, the server out to the side. If you're the one that's constantly saying to yourself, how can I hit a perfect shot? How can I hit a perfect shot? You're statistically making it very, very difficult to win. It's only going to be on your most dialed in, most precise, like best timing days that you actually feel like you're playing well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a ton of sense, uh, Ian. Um, love that. Uh, so we've got a question from uh, KW Tennis Nation. How do you retrain juniors to stop slapping returns down the middle in doubles and redirect <laughs> short angle <laughs> cross court by simply hitting the outside of the ball? What do you think about that? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, you can't make any human do something that they don't want to do. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I think just starting there is, is really important. And if you're a coach, uh, I think beginning with that basic kind of human psychology framework is, is really important. It, it doesn't matter how badly I want my student to serve with a continental grip. If it feels awkward and it goes against the 30 years of habit and experience that they have hitting with a semi-Western grip, like there's no amount of like begging or pleading or coercion or threats or like... <laughs> or like making fun of like there's there's nothing i can at the end of the day the i have to leave it up to them to make that decision so in the case of like working with a junior player who just loves smashing shots in general like just like nick curio style and is just going for highlight shots you can present information you know you can be supportive you can you can uh, demonstrate like um examples and kind of recall like oh remember like when this happened and and give them reinforcement but at the end of the day you can't make them change the way that they approach the game and maybe that's like that's frustrating but that's the reality of of humans so i would say be supportive uh be nurturing um be positive if you go in a direction where like you're challenging them in like a negative context or putting them down or like or making fun of their mistakes 
or you know pointing out if, if all if the only way you go about it is pointing out the negative you're going to have a hard time influencing people <laughs> so i i think coming about it from a very positive and like nurturing perspective and this is the, this is true for ourselves too right like when i go out and work with my with myself and i self guide I, I i work hard to come about it from a supportive like nurturing like if i'm constantly putting myself down and telling myself how bad i suck and how bad my my habits are i'm probably not going to make it very far so uh that's, that's my my best answer to that yes indeed ian you know we've got to treat ourselves more like we treat good friends you know we we wouldn't talk to ourselves <laughs> like uh, you know like we would with our friends or normally so uh great stuff ian uh perhaps one more so um Victor asks, what's your mindset when returning a serve in doubles when opponents are in I formation? Do you aim for one I... side down the middle or go for the lob? Or do you think I'm going to put a hole through the sole of whoever is across <laughs> the net, maybe grab a beer with them after the match if we're both alive after? <laughs> wow, hole, I got to I gotta give credit where credit's due. Put a hole through the sole of the that's – uh, that's a nice – I don't think I've heard that, <laughs> that phrase before. That's, that's solid. Yeah, so it's a. Uh, I love the eye formation because it forces the returner into a decision. There's no longer the clear cut example in a in a normal you know double formation. There's a very obvious. This this person is is physically telling you, I got I got here, and this person is physically telling you I got here, and so there's kind of a, a comfort in knowing that. Um, normally unless there's a planned poach which at most levels of doubles there's not a whole lot of that going on it's more so the net player saying can i get it can i get it can i get it and if they tell themselves yes then like they try but at most levels of doubles there's not a ton of planned poaching and so you can kind of be comforted in the in the um pattern that okay this is like my my safe zone over here and so you can kind of rest easy just picking that target and going to it over and over again the eye formation is fantastic because what it's doing is forcing the returner to make a choice do i want to aim for like the normal place where i would normally aim or is this net player going to cover that cross court shot and do i need to aim down the line instead the worst thing you can do and i think <laughs> I don't remember all the holes. I, I'm going to remember it and put a hole through their uh, soul. Um, <laughs> the server's partner is hoping you wait till the last second and try to make a decision, like at the very last moment. Oh, oh, he's he's going that way. Okay, I got to go down the line. Or oh, he's covering here. I got to go cross court. He's hoping you're distracted. He's hoping you have doubt. He's hoping you make a last se second decision, and he's especially hoping that he triggers you psychologically. Into feeling like you son of a like you you dirt like I'm just gonna smash it like that's what he's most hoping is that you you like take it as some kind of like threat and respond emotionally and try to hit it through him because that's what's gonna lead to the most errors especially w when you layer that on top of all the other stuff like trying to make a decision like last minute and all, like and you're trying to like smash the ball and like no like this is what they're hoping is gonna happen when they line up in I formation so. The solution is the opposite of all those things. Pick a target before the serve gets hit and just hit it towards that target. That's the best response. And if it just so happens that the, the target that you picked ahead of time is the direction that that person went, okay. That they have every right to get lucky and pick the direction that you aim for. Categorize it in your mind, put it in like your, your file cabinet and kids out there, watching don't know what file cabinets are put it in your your file cabinet and say okay 66 percent of the time like the last two out of three times he's covered down the line okay now you're starting to get get some like stats and some data going in your mind and you can pick cross court and if he happens to guess correctly again okay so you're gonna you're gonna have to figure out whatever the predominant pattern pattern i promise you they're not gonna equally split it and always guess right you know a certain percentage of the time you're going to hit to the open courts and keep in mind a certain percentage of the time that they guess right and intercept the ball your partner is going to do their job and keep you in the points and you still have a chance of winning the point 
But if you approach that challenge from like a macho, like, oh, I need to show him and like smash a winner or like knock him over at the net, that's exactly – as a doubles player who loves eye formation, that's exactly what I'm hoping. I, I, hope I, <laughs> I hope I get deep down into your brain and just like psych you into trying all kinds of different stuff, like fancy things and hitting harder than you normally do and angles that you never tried before. That's exactly what I hope that the returner is going to do. Thank you, Ian. Love that uh, advice. Hope Victor, hope you got some good value out of that. So, um, good stuff, Ian. Um, do you want to proceed with the uh, the strategy vid you got? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let's talk about singles. And there's there's not going to be any like big you know surprises here. It's going to follow the the same uh, basic theme. If your opponent on the the far side is serving and you're returning, this. <laughs> Singles is so much easier when you watch um, even like elite professional level tennis, WTA or, or ATP. The fact that you no longer have that net player as an obstacle to try to hit around, you no longer have the offensive threat of that opponent just right up there in your face, hoping that they get the ball is just such a weight, you know, off your shoulders. And so if you're not having a particularly good return day or if the return of serve is just historically not a strong uh, shot for you, then you should literally be thinking of a target area right here. <laughs> and like that's literally your target for every return. First serve, second serve. And if late in the first set, you're like kind of you're feeling good and like oh, I'm starting to get some uh, some rhythm and some timing, I'm really feeling solid. Then from there, I would say secondary uh, target, good place to go, is going to be uh, cross court and deep, simply because you've got a little bit more court real estate to work with. Now we're starting to isolate our opponent to one side of the court to maybe set up a pattern in our favor, maybe open the court up on the next shot, or just pin them in that corner if that happens to be a pattern that you'd like to play, uh, add side to add side or do side to do side. Um, but that's kind of like main choice number two. And then if you're like partway through the second set or deep in the match and you're just like your timing is fantastic, you're really feeling your return, you've picked out a particular spot that's like a weakness for your opponent and you want to change direction, then that's basically your third option is going to be going uh, down the line. So option number one is just going to be past the service line to the middle. Priority option number two, if you're feeling solid and you're feeling pretty good, you can go deep and cross courts. And then third on the list is going to be hitting anything uh, straight or down the line because it's a lower percentage shot and you also create much more running for yourself afterwards. When you hit cross court to this green target or to this uh, yellow target, you're, you know, let's make a, a cool little chart here. When you hit down the line to that red target, your recovery position for the next shot is gonna be that red X. When you hit to the green spot, your recovery spot for the next ball is gonna be the green X. And yellow, an ideal recovery spot, is gonna be the yellow X. So you need to ask yourself the question, like which X do I wanna to run to after hitting this shot? And the yellow one is like highest percentage in terms of just giving yourself a lot of real estate, a lot of margin for error around that target area. Green, less margin for error, but really nice in terms in, in terms of your recovery is going to be the least strenuous. You're basically automatically in, in the right position. The red one, lowest margin, most difficult shot to make, and I've got to run twice as far as the, the green one. So this is the way I would kind of prioritize uh, targeting for singles. Players should be keeping it super simple and only hit to these different targets based on the way you should make your decision is based on how is your return feeling on this particular day. Another layer um, you could put on top of that is how much offense do I really need to beat this player? If you're playing somebody who's like two levels above you, the red target just, it's like, well, I got it. Like I got to come up with something when I hit the yellow or green, they're just destroying me. And it's like not even close. And so the red target might be necessary kind of behind in every single rally on the other hand if you're two levels above your opponent and easily beating them 
you know, why, why would you even risk the, like, you sure, you could show off and try to hit a whole bunch of red targets, but if you could beat them just as easily going for yellow or green, make it, like, make it easy on yourself. Force them into red targets and give yourself green ones. And over the long run, that's going to that's gonna pay out just huge dividends as opposed to trying the low percentage, you know, low likelihood shots yourself. Yeah, thanks for that, Ian. And, you know, this pretty much answers this question from uh, Live in Tennis, which um, says, can we return the serve only to, to neutralize the serve or to be offensive to end the point? And, you know, as you mentioned, it really does depend on, you know, the different levels of, of the players and what you want to accomplish, what you need to actually, you know, implement in order to win. So um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but uh, it seems like you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the best answer is both. I mean, uh, if you only have one or the other, um, if you've only developed a return game around one of the three phases of play, offensive, neutral, or defensive, there's a lot of players out there who only have de defense for return of serve. There's other players out there that only have offense. And then I would say most tennis players kind of fall somewhere in the middle and they kind of have their, their comfort zone. They're not particularly good at playing defense. They're also, also not particularly good at like attacking right off the return. Most players kind of just are kind of in no man's land and, and that's fine, you know, to start off. But if you want to be the best tennis player possible, you should purposefully train to try to master all three of those responses. When somebody is hitting a 110 mile an hour serve, what technical like things do I need to develop? The hands, the footwork, the preparation, the positioning in order to just get it back in play because that's like the best I can do with that serve. And on the other end of the spectrum, when somebody hits me just the weakest, shortest, like spinniest, you know, easiest, you know, serve ever, you know, ironically, that's a shot that a lot of players struggle with. So you have to, again, purposefully develop what type of shape and spin do I need to hit to be successful with that? What kind of footwork in terms of transitioning forwards do I need to develop to be successful with that? And with the return of serve, I just feel like, I feel like it's, um, there's understanding and acknowledgement that, yeah, of course it's important, but when you go to your local courts, when you go to your local club and look up and down the, the courts at what people are practicing, Nobody's practicing. Nobody's practicing the, their offensive return of serve. Nobody's practicing their defensive return of serve. It's almost like the, the time that's allotted is just kind of uh, an afterthought. It's like, oh, well, let's play some points out at the end. And then that's when you hit your returns. And so, of course, you're not going to practice anything new or different or develop any kind of new skills. So I guess I would just kind of come back to that theme that we, we started with, Mirban, of being purposeful about setting time aside for the return specifically. And once you get into a little bit of a habit or a routine of doing that, then you can start to branch out into other flavors of the return that most players aren't very good at. Yeah. Thanks again for mentioning that point. I mean, you know, as, as you mentioned with Craig O'Shaughnessy and, and Warren Pretorius and others, um, you know, they've mentioned that the first four shots are going to be like something like 80% plus of all the points. So really focusing your practice on the serve and the return are going to pay huge dividends. So uh, we have another question from, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, Charlie. So hi, Ian. What about a hard serve into the body? So I'm not sure if that means in terms of like how we should handle it as the returner, perhaps. Maybe you want to take that angle. Yeah, I would definitely, uh, I would start with where we started with the footwork. Like, Charlie, do you split step on your return of serve? And before you say yes, do you have, like, can you show me proof? <laughs> uh, it's easy to assume that you do, but I would, I would love for you to record yourself in your next match and find out if you split step or not. So it, all, it all starts with that. And if you happen to miss the first part of, of our talk today, um, please make sure to watch it because it's so unbelievably important. The, the, yeah proactive nature of good returners it can't be overstated how important that is so um i actually here let me let me go back to the the ipad um i don't have specifically in mind a return here from novak where he got jammed but if we play through a bunch i bet there's going to be at least one right um <laughs> let's see here I just want to, I'd love to find an actual, 
example that's just not either right in his strike zone or uh being stretched out wide because we covered the out wide footwork pretty pretty well already yeah yeah kind of close okay so here's a relatively yeah yeah, here's a relatively good example so the first couple of steps remain constant the the split step routine and the next thing we talked about earlier was the the unit turn and then the pivoting of the of the outside foot this kind of goes in reverse when you get jammed up. In other words, normally for a, a normal uh, backhand return, after Novak takes his step and makes his split, the first move would be for his left foot to pivot left and then his body weight to transition in that direction. But once he recognizes and realizes that I need more space here, what he's going to do is plant off of that uh, left foot and actually push his body weight uh, this is actually a great example because he's not falling back and onto his right foot. What you'll see him do here is his right foot actually moves forwards as he pushes to the right. Hmm. And so what a lot of players do, I think, is they'll, they'll hit the split step, uh, turn and be like, oh, here, here comes the backhand. But then as soon as they realize it's coming into the body, they'll kind of like fall back and lean away from the ball. Uh, Novak's example here, I think, is a perfect one of reading that he needs more space, but then falling to the right and and forwards. And I think that's an ideal, you know, reaction or response to buy more time, buy not more time. I'm sorry, to buy more space, give yourself a little bit more wiggle room in terms of like making a comfortable swing. Um, once you've made that pivot, if you can shift off to the side, either to the to the right or to the left, depending on what the shot is, that's the goal. If you can just make it a neutral shift, that's great. If you can fall to the side and forward, that's fantastic. You know, worst case scenario is is like falling back in a way while like trying to give yourself a little bit of extra time. Uh, that's obviously not not the one that we'd like to choose. Um, that that was a good example. I'm glad glad that happened to come up. <laughs> yeah, nice find there, Ian. Uh, quick on your toes there. Um, and just uh, just to re- really quickly to contrast that, so here's like a, a standard backhand where it's the same step, same split step, sta- same first move with the, the left foot, but then his weight is going to track in the direction that his foot is pointing. So that's the, the opposite of what he did when the ball was coming right in at his left, uh, his left hip. Sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. For, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. So sure. we got another question. Cool question here. Uh, Jamie, I play both uh, uh, really good servers and really bad servers. So how can I get better at timing both fast and slow serves? Yeah, I mean, I hate to just, you know, use the coach answer, like just practice. But I think a, a drill that I did with the, the player that we looked at, the, the student I had uh, a week or two ago, we started off our training with me um, hitting her slow serves from the opposite service line. Most people watching are probably familiar with the idea of a training partner hitting from the opposite service line and actually standing like instead of on the baseline, like right here to try to train like low reaction time, like fast, uh, receiving really fast serves. But I actually started from from this position and hit her a bunch of serves where I was like just barely hitting the the racket, uh, the ball off my strings. And so that gave her uh, a comfort level. It gave her some rhythm. Uh, It also gave her practice with her positioning and her spacing and her swing, developing her own racket head speed and her own energy into the ball. And then as she got uh, comfortable, as I was standing here, I slowly started to increase the speed a little bit. And so I would encourage you to, First of all, practicing with a partner where you're serving from the service line um, not only takes you out of kind of the normal, boring, like routine of like baseline to baseline returns, but it makes it really easy for the practice partner, the person who's facilitating the return practice, to just calmly hit the ball in the box over and over. It's a million times easier to hit 20 serves in a row in the box from the service line than it is from the baseline. So a repetition, but if the server starts off really slow and calm, it can give the returner 
that practice against a serve that's really weak and slow and without blowing out the arm or like getting the server like too bored. And then once you get some good repetition there, uh, then the server, the, the practice partner, can start to slowly increase the speed of the delivery. And then eventually, you know, if you hit a, a full serve, like normal pace serve from the service line at a returner, you're basically simulating, you know, a serve that's like 30 miles an hour faster than what they're used to. Um, and that can be a fantastic way to train the other end of the spectrum where you're receiving like the fastest serve ever, but it's a million times easier to hit a hard flat serve in the box from the service line than it is from the baseline. In fact, your practice partner can probably swing it like 70% and basically give you the flavor or the, not the flavor, but the feeling of like receiving the fastest serve you ever receive. So they're not like cranking and like blowing out their arm, you know, serve after serve after serve. And it, it simulates for you that, that type of delivery where you have like very small amount of time to, to react and respond. So that's how I, if I was working with a practice partner, that's, that's definitely, I would not go back to the baseline uh, or ask my partner to go back to the baseline and be like, okay, now hit it as hard as you can every time, please. Like for the next like half, like that's just not a nice thing to ask somebody to do. <laughs> So uh, I would experiment with, with standing on the, the service line, start slow, and then ramp it up, and then finish you know, really fast. And it can give you both ends of the spectrum. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Ian. Uh, sounds great. And uh, Gordon, so Gordon asked uh, views on having one foot ahead of one of, uh, of the other at the start, but I think we covered that in the beginning. Uh, so you might want to rewind, Actually, Gordon. Or did you want to add to that? Yeah, let me give you. Uh, I don't think I, I don't have the clip right here on my iPad, but uh, really random. Everybody, how many people are watching right now, Mirban? Uh, I think like a hundred or so. All right, so you a hundred people watching. You're about to be like let in on like super classified trivia uh, here for tennis. <laughs> Somebody pointed this out to me like a month or two ago. I, I ne it never occurred to me that it would be possible or that anybody had ever done it but I went and reviewed some footage and sure enough, uh, if you watch play a uh, match play footage of Andy Murray, uh, widely regarded as one of the best, you know, returners of all time. Um, he, if I, I might get this wrong, but it's, it's one or the other on the deuce side, he starts with his right foot forward and kind of his, like, you know, you can probably picture him like waiting with his racket, his, his right foot's forward. And he has kind of like a, kind of like a rock back and forth. And then he'll stride forwards on his left foot and then go into a split step. On the ad side, he starts with his left foot in front and rocks uh, back and forth. And then steps forwards onto his right foot and makes a split step. Uh, and somebody said that to me in a live uh, stream in my members area a couple weeks ago. I was like, no. And I, <laughs> we went and reviewed some footage. And sure enough, like he starts with different feet forwards depending on which side of the court you can you can go probably win a lot of bets uh, with that with that information. Um, so I I thought it was super like random, and just an example of, of how this is like personal preference and like a stylistic thing. Don't get caught up in like the details, like which foot starts in front of the other. It, re it really doesn't matter as long as you find a comfortable routine, you get your body activated, and you get yourself you know firing at just the right time. That's what's most important. Gotcha. Thanks, Ian. So um, I know we, we covered a lot of questions here. Did, did you want or did you have like additional stuff to show us on the monitor? I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, uh, you know, interrupting anything. No, no, that's uh, those are all the main things. Um, all the, the main uh, points I wanted to get across uh, footwork, uh, the split step, the movements, the technique, double strategy, single strategy. We, we covered quite a bit. Um, so yeah, are there any other uh, good questions you have? Yeah, let me take a look here. Uh, oh, Gregory, what are your thoughts on returning against tough formations and accurate serving when the angles are very limited? Should the lob be used more often? Yeah, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, if we go back to the, the board really quickly, I think it's important 
Mirban, do you have any idea how many square feet of space the doubles court is? Like just you, like one one half, like one one side of the doubles court. What, what? How many square feet would you guess it is? Oh man, this is why I went to law school to avoid when math. Uh, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I, I actually have no idea. <laughs> that would probably be wildly inaccurate. <laughs> Oh, you got it. You got it. I put you on the spot. You got to put a number oh, okay. out there now. Okay. Let me pick a number feet? and I'll pick a number and look like a total fool here because of my math. Uh, 70 square feet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now I know why you didn't want to guess. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the answer is, but, but that's good. That, uh, it just helps reinforce my point. The, the amount of square footage, just one side of the, the court that, you're responsible for covering in doubles. It's a little bit over 1,400 <laughs> square feet. <laughs> so, like, if you think about it, uh, like, if I'm, if I, if my wingspan is, let's just say, six feet across, uh, if I'm occupying one space, one spot on the court, like I'm just standing here, and I can go six feet right and left, uh, six feet forward and backwards, just from this like single spot, uh, we're talking about 36 square foot chunk of court that i'm occupying and obviously after the ball gets hit uh, of course like i'm able to move and so i can i can cover much more than 36 square feet obviously but the the point i'm trying to get across here is you think about how tiny you know 36 square feet is compared to 1400 and yes your opponents if they're good doubles players are using australian formation they're they're using i formation uh, they're making you second guess, like which part of the court can I hit down the line? Can I hit cross court? Oh, it seems like they're everywhere. They can't be everywhere. <laughs> I guess that the point I'm trying to get across is this this person up at the net, it's their job to try to make you feel like you don't have any options. What I'm trying to communicate here is there's lots of options if you stay calm and kind of go through a checklist and, and the person who asked, uh, asked the question did a good job start. It's like, okay, I got the, got the angle. You know, I can try going down the line. Like, should I try to lob? That's, that's exactly the thought process you should have. This person up at the net cannot cover all 1400 square feet. In fact, both players together cannot cover all 1400 square feet there's something open every time the ball comes your way um, your job as a good tennis tactitioner is to basically play sherlock holmes play detective try like poking different holes in their uh, game plan until you find an, a little like foothold or handhold where it's like ah oh, maybe maybe i should try this and then go there for a while and if they adjust and adapt then poke someplace else and so it's great you're playing players that are this level that they're making you second guess everything. But your job is to come up with lots of different answers. And I promise you, there is a right answer. I can't give you the magic of, oh yeah, you just uh, hit with backspin on your, uh, on your forehand side uh, down the line. And uh, Al-Ghazam, like you, you win the match. <laughs> like it's, it's not to, like, there's a whole lot of specifics and like uh, details that go into deciding like what is the right answer you have to reverse engineer what's happening in the points and then figure out out of those 1400 square feet what where's the 50 square foot chunk that they're leaving open right now and you have to have good enough awareness and uh, shot control to be able to take advantage of that sorry to put you Thanks, on the spot Ian. <laughs> <laughs> no no problem i need that exposing seriously like uh, just a few thousand off that's all um let's yeah, see here yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> Very minor. So um, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So Gordon uh, asks, a number of top players like Tsitsipas and Osaka now are using the forehand grip on the first serve um, return, I guess. So maybe this will become more acceptable. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ian? Well, that was actually my go-to for many years. Um, I first was told that or taught that in college by my, my college coach that, well... I don't want to hit backhand returns. So, and I don't want to block my return unless I have to. So, so why would I, why would I wait in a, a continental grip if 
block this or hit, you know, backspin. And so in college, I started waiting in my uh, my forehands uh, topspin grip, and I, I feel like that really helped me build a lot of confidence in my my forehand return because I was basically signaling to my brain, I want a forehand, I want a forehand, and it was signal, signaling to my feet, I want a forehand, I want a forehand. Now there's there's pros and cons. Like when my opponent um, deliberately finds my backhand, okay, well now it's, it's a little more work to get around to my my backhand grip. Recently, if you watch my recent match play uh, videos, you'll see me starting to wait in a backhand uh, grip. And I, I, I won't go down the rabbit hole of like uh, why this is, but long story short, it's working better for me right now. It's, it's been easier for me to move from my new topspin backhand grip around to my forehand than it is for me to move from my forehand grip all the way up to my new uh, topspin backhand grip. And so... You'll see professional players do it both ways, but I think the larger chunk statistically is waiting with the with the weapon, like wait with the one you really would like to hit. Um, you'll see players do it different ways, but um, I haven't heard that suggested quite a while ago, and I think a lot of professional players are already doing it that way. Feel free to experiment with it. Um, there's not. I, this is one of those things where I feel like it's you have to know yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, and also the strengths and weaknesses of your your opponents to really make the best decision. And it can the right decision, I think, can be a lot of different things. But I would, up until very recently, I was pretty um, on board with the idea that waiting with the forehand or whatever your favorite shot is, it might be your backhand, is the is the way to go. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, appreciate that. So I'm trying to find this question. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, oh, yeah. So it's about the I formation, uh, Ian. So Joe asks, uh, versus the I formation, isn't the netter, uh, isn't the netter all going to move away from the middle, like a net person? So doesn't it make sense to hit down the middle? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I like that. Uh, it depends. So... I formation doesn't necessarily mean, first of all, that both players are literally like dead uh, in the center. You'll see variations on the I formation. And I think one of my favorite ones is the net player just being slightly towards the, the cross court side. And that way, the, the net player still very much has the option of covering uh, down the line. It's a little bit more work, but what it essentially does does is just put the net player exactly square in the middle of what a cross court return of serve trajectory would be. And so if the server opts to cover down the line, all the net player has to do is just like pop up and be like, here I am. Okay, go try to hit, go ahead, hit down the line, like go for the lower percentage shot. Um, and you can, you can play this both ways where the, the net player slightly is skewed to the, to the line side. I think you have to know your opponent, your specific opponent. Do they just have a smoking down the line return? Some, some players do, and they struggle hitting a good cross court shot. Or is it the is it the opposite? Uh, but please don't think that I formation has to be both players dead in the center, and then you have to like run, you know, like like break and then like run to the other side of the court. That's absolutely it. Absolutely does not or should not be that like. Uh, binary or like cut and dry you should be playing with it and and adjusting it um based on the patterns that you're seeing and where your opponents like to hit the returns the most or where they struggle to hit their returns the most um, so please don't think you should be like running to one side of the court uh, or the other in fact i would say that if you just play it dead in the middle and obviously you, you can't cross the hash mark as the server just public service annou announcement but um if you literally both play dead in the center and you're right in the middle as the returner and you draw like a reasonable, a reasonably well hit down the line shot, you know, let's say to here, like not the best return ever, but you know, like a solid down the line shot. And then you draw a line to like a reasonably well hit, you know, cross court angle. And you just connect those lines. You'll see that if you're dead in the center, you're already closer to the cross court shot anyway. So there's really no reason for you to. 
uh, popping up already on the cross court side of the court anyway. So um, yeah, I guess I'll I guess I'll leave it there. Does that make sense? For, did I explain that well enough? Yeah, no, definitely you did, uh, Ian. Appreciate that uh, very detailed explanation. Um, let's see. We do have a bunch, but I would say probably a couple more since I've got another stream <laughs> very soon. So um, let's see. Uh, so Jamie has an interesting question. Uh, so she asks, what about sometimes hitting a drop shot return? I saw one of the ESPN ladies on TV saying that players, especially females, should use that shot more. So what do you think about that, Ian? Yeah, I totally agree. I think there, at most levels of doubles, there's not a huge comfort level with serving and volleying or returning and volleying. And I think the majority of, of recreational or amateur doubles players would either like to be on the baseline on their own terms or at the net on their own terms. It's like, okay, if I'm going to start off at Turner, I'm a baseline. If I'm going to start a return, huge level of comfort for most players navigating this like in between space. So I think anytime you can force your opponents to either have to make the transition player to baseline player, and play of trying to figure out ways to make their opponent work vertically. There's a lot of focus on lateral. Like, how do I stretch them, you know, side to side, like back and forth, right and left? How do, how do I hit the corners, you know, on the serve and stretch them and open up the angle volley or the, the sharp angle, you know, serve or whatever. I don't think there's enough emphasis on on up and back is way or doubles people view this line in the center as some kind of like force field this like uh it's like okay this is my side and this is <laughs> your side and there's a there's like a almost kind of like an unspoken like rule that you you don't come over to my side and I, i'll i'll leave you alone like you can you can have your side as long as you let me have my side and there's like the there's like this uh, anxiety about like crossing that that line, and so if you can master that you know that drop shot, it might be way easier for this player to get it. But there's an automatic like hesitation of like oh oh do I I don't want to like it I don't I don't want to like go in like your like zone over there. Uh, meanwhile, the baseliner is like way back behind the baseline. So yeah, a couple quick thoughts there. Why I think it. it absolutely can be a really smart play awesome great stuff ian um so i think the last one we'll touch upon for today uh, uh is uh live in tennis i heard in uh in first serve return chip the return how effective is the chip uh um i kind of have a running a running joke with with the internet where i like celebrate really hard anytime i hit a a backhand slice uh, for a winner uh, because I, I think there's just like a cultural and this is just a human thing, right? Like we're, we're just kind of conditioned to, to be impressed by the, the big and the strong and the, the powerful solution to problems. Uh, like if you can hit 110 mile an hour forehand winner, like that's always going to be more impressive to people than hitting a 40 mile an hour one. Like, it's just like, well, they got lucky with that one. Like it, it wasn't like a big like highlight shot. Um, now, on the other, like to play, you know, devil's advocate to that starting position, you'll reach a certain level of uh, doubles. This was a doubles specific, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty you'll sure. You'll reach yeah. a certain level of doubles where, when when the opposite net player sees you take the racket back open they're just like all over like they will poach hard every time they see the the open racket face and so you might be able to get a good enough slice to still neutralize that that net player but it's dramatically more difficult than being able to hit a topspin or drive 
shot, which moves through the court faster and makes it more difficult for that net player to intercept the ball. So I would say up to totally, you know, generalizing and, and ballparking here, but um, I would say up to middle of like 4.0 here in, in the US, uh, you know, NTRP, um, you're probably totally fine slicing from the, the backcourt. Once you get up to high 4.0, again, I'm generalizing, high 4.0, like 4.5, and definitely above 4.5, once you get to 5.0, man, that slice had better be unbelievable. If you're going to slice from behind the baseline, uh, you know, 5.0 level doubles, that net player and or both net players are just going to be all over that that ball uh, in a heartbeat. And if you don't put it like just over the top of the net, like in just the right spot, then they make your life really, really difficult. So um, I would say, yeah, I don't know what your level is. So depending on where you are right now, uh, you might be totally fine for a while. Or if you happen to be in the middle of 4.0 right now and you're like, man, what do I do to make it up to 4.5? Like I've been here for a while. It might be, it might, you know, be time. It might be time to focus on making that, that shift and developing more of a, a weapon uh, with whichever side. I think it was, was it a backhand question? the backhand drive, it might be time to start to make it a weapon instead of just being able to chip it back. Love it, Ian. So before we go, I do just want to mention um, and share my screen real quick. Uh, I think, let me know if you see this full uh, image here on the screen, Ian. Do you see the... Yep. Um, okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I need to move a few more things. So yeah, basically, and I've put in a, a link uh, that is actually linked to Ian if you'd like to support Ian as well as myself. So I mean, we do have the option for the all access pass, and you know, <laughs> I mean, Ian, you know, just presented over an hour of um, you know, pure masterclass, you know, on on doubles, a technique and strategy, and a lot of times with the information, you know, we we need to watch it more than once. And you know, I know that everybody or a lot of people are enjoying it with a free ticket to watch the sessions, but if you want to get you know, a fantastic um, package here. Oh, and I think I might have to remove this comment, actually. I don't know if I could do that, but um, let's see. Give me one. Shout out to Jamie. Shout out to Jamie. Yeah. Oh, thank you for letting, to, for allowing me to locate that. <laughs> actually, let me just do this and then. Oh, great. Uh, Shout out to Ard. Ard, yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. We're we're almost there. We you know. But um basically, you know, many layers of technology. I know. With, with the All Access Pass though, you're going to get a lot of great value, you know. You get not only access to all the videos here, but you're also going to get uh access to all the audio files, so whenever you want to listen to them, you know, and the and the shower is my favorite, but you know, whenever, you know, you're driving, you're cooking, um, to, to absorb and reabsorb all the, of the great information from the summit. And then you'll also get uh, transcripts of all the summit sessions, which takes my team like just so many hours of work to transcribe. Uh, and then you're also going to get the summit implementation worksheet, um, as well as the access to the summit Facebook group, and then uh, live streams with myself and guest coaches, and then discounts from our partners. So as you could see, it's like a huge... Um, value that you're getting here. Um, so definitely would be appreciated uh, if you would consider getting the All Access Pass. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it that I wanted to cover for that. But uh, Ian, do you have any uh, closing thoughts or anything uh, to, to share in terms of like double strategy and tactics and all that? Be the ball. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh... No, no, I think, no, I think we, we covered a lot. Um, awesome questions from everybody. And uh, I, I love that you gave me that, that topic of a return to serve because I, I just think it's so underappreciated and under practice, under trained. It's under focused, focused on. Is that right? Under focused on. So yeah. I, I'm glad, I'm glad we had this whole session just focused on that. And uh, no, I think we covered it all pretty well. Like you said, people uh, have the ability to play it back. I've definitely watched it back several times. And I guess I would, what I would close with is, and I brought it up at least uh, twice, but I'll, I'll finish by telling people to record themselves one more time because it's going to reveal so much. And that's why people don't do it because they're intimidated. They're going to find, but 
you need to ask yourself, do you really take your improvement seriously? Like if you very badly want to improve and you feel like you've been stuck for a while, uh, it should be a no brainer to, to record yourself because the one or two things that you're like most shocked by are going to just absolutely supercharge your development over the last, over the next, you know, two, three, four months. When, when all of a sudden you discover and it's like revealed to you what that big thing is or two or three big things are, uh, it, huge improvements become possible in a short period of time. So, so in case of the, Return to serve and everything else. I've just encouraged people to record themselves, see what they're actually really doing in real life. And then you can kind of compare, compare and contrast what we talked about today and the images we saw today of, of world-class players and you'll know exactly what to do. So I, I would just encourage people to, uh, to do that. Awesome, Ian. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on to the stream. It was always uh, it's it's always a pleasure to uh, to you know connect with you and uh, share information. So, uh, like we said, uh, record yourself and then also uh, go to uh, the Essential Tennis YouTube channel to check out all their great content that they have. Uh, you know, Ian told me that he has a big backlog of stuff, so um, definitely it's uh, waiting to be pushed out there for you all to enjoy. So. Uh, Ian, thanks again. Uh, you know, best wishes moving forward. And it was great to have you on this live stream summit session. And thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, Mirabon. It was a pleasure being here. Appreciate you inviting me on. Thanks for having me. And big thank you to everybody watching. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for your passion. It's what it's what keeps Mirabon going. It's what keeps me going. Your your interest, your enthusiasm, your energy keeps us pushing forward. So so thank you all for being here. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Take care.